Um, thank you so much for joining us today here on Treaty for Territory and the Traditional Homeland of the Métis. As we proceed with the event, we pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place, and we reaffirm our relationship with one another. So welcome to Medicare at 50, Past Lessons, Future Challenges with Jeffrey Simpson, presented by the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy. And as you already know, many of you already know, most of you already know, the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy is a provincial center for advanced study and research in public policy and administration. It's a really special place and the product of a partnership now 11 years old between the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan and is really based in the spirit of collaboration and innovation that defines, defines Saskatchewan. So I'm Alana Katapan. I'm an assistant professor here at the school. Um, I'm a scholar of health policy as well, and I'm your moderator for today's event. Not that we need so much moderation. Um, and I know for those who need it, the washrooms are out this door and then to your right, just in case you need it. But to business. Um, we have the honor, a real honor, of uh, welcoming Jeffrey Simpson to the JSGS today to speak to us about the past and future of Medicare half a century after its establishment. Medicare in Canada feels like it's always a timely topic. Um, it's central to Canadian pride, even when it's threatened, even when it fails or is failing. And it seems like there's always a court case on the docket of clinicians fed up with the single-payer system, as is occurring currently with the Brian Day case in BC, seeking additional fees to treat their patients beyond the, bond, beyond the bounds of the healthcare system, but often because they want to provide better care. And so there's many struggles that continue um, in the provision of care in Canada. And so we're incredibly lucky to have Jeffrey Simpson here to speak about this. He's really an expert on the matter. Really, there's a whole book. He wrote a whole book. Okay, shaking his head. Um, Jeffrey's an officer of the Order of Canada, who is best known to me and maybe to many of you uh, for his very long-running national affairs column in the Globe and Mail. He's written seven books, probably more are coming, I hope, um, one of which won the Governor General's Award, and another, which is on the Canadian healthcare system in particular, won the much-coveted Donner Prize for the best book on public policy. He's received eight honorary degrees. Like, this list is going to go for a while. He's won eight honorary degrees, lectured at several dozen universities in Canada and abroad. He's a member of the Trilateral Commission and the Board of Governors at the University of Ottawa. And he's also a senior fellow of the Graduate School of Policy and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa. So please welcome me, uh, please join me in welcoming <clears throat> Jeffrey Simpson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alana. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for, uh, for being here. First of all, may I uh, say what a pleasure it is to see John Courtney. Uh, he is one of the real titans. I've spent 40 years writing about the <clears throat> Canadian matters, and Courtney and David Smith, uh, formerly of this university, were two political scientists that those of us in my trade paid careful attention to all the time. So it's lovely to see you here. I'm sorry about your foot, but the rest of you look damn good. <laughs> and also Ken Coates. Uh, I just said to Ken before, uh, when I get discouraged sometimes about uh, what's going on in the resource sector and with First Nations, and that was what my lecture in Regina two days ago was about, will probably be up on the website soon, I read Ken and I feel better. So nice to see him in the flesh. Thank you. Um, I thought since this is Saskatchewan, uh, and since is this roughly the 50th uh, anniversary of the introduction of Medicare, which, of course, it started in the 1940s in Saskatchewan, that it would be an appropriate subject to reflect upon here now at this moment. So that's why I want to talk about Medicare, because it is about half a century old. And for the largest number of people who have been, were born in Canada and grew up in Canada, it's the only health care system that they have known. They might have heard about systems elsewhere, especially in the United States, but they don't really know very much about those systems. We've heard about the costs and the inequities of uh, health care in the United States, and Canadians generally don't like what they hear about health care south of the border. And they were always comforted when they heard uh, Jean Chrétien uh, say, down there, meaning the United States, hey, check your wallet before your pulse. And they said, oh boy, I'm glad I don't live down there. Beating up on the U.S. healthcare system um, underpins Canadian sense of moral superiority, 
uh, and also our complacency about our own system. Canadians know very little, as I said, about other largely publicly funded healthcare systems around the world, many of which actually score better in international comparative studies. But even if they did know more, chances are that Medicare is so entrenched now in Canada that changing to a kind of social insurance model such as they have in the Netherlands or Germany or a more mixed public-private system as they have in New Zealand, Australia, and France or putting all doctors on salary as in the United Kingdom or allowing private uh, clinics to compete with public clinics for government money as in Sweden, those models to introduce them in Canada would be very challenging indeed. If we had to do public health care all over again, knowing what we now do know about other systems and how they often perform better than ours, we might have opted for another public system. But in the 40s, in this province, we were a much more British place. And Tommy Douglas had come from Britain. And the British, after the Second World War, our allies in war and in peace, had introduced public health, the National Health Service, the beverage report. So that became the model. We certainly didn't look in the post-war period to Germany and war-torn Europe. And we didn't like the United States, which was much more private then than it is now. There was no public Medicaid in the United States. So we were the offspring of the British model, Beverage Report, National Health Service. So to have opted for another kind of public system would now, in retrospect, be like being wise after the fact. Uh, A bit like today's rage for condemning public figures of today for uh, uh, public, public figures of a century ago for not acting as we wish today they would have acted. The wisdom of hindsight is as wonderful as it is unattainable. So six years ago, thank you for the reference to the book. I have many unsold copies, by the way. If you, <laughs> you know, Since I'm in a university, you know in universities they say you have to publish or perish if you're a professor, but... In my writing, book writing career, you can do both, I, I can assure you. <laughs> but at any rate, I did publish this book about the history of the uh, Canadian healthcare system, seeking to understand how it came to be, uh, and then about the current reality as I then saw it and understood it. I think the book, I modestly assert, was timely for a couple of reasons. It arrived at the same time, roughly speaking, as many people working in the healthcare system itself were coming to understand and even to admit publicly, which had been very dangerous in the past, that notwithstanding all the political rhetoric about Canada having the best healthcare system in the world, that oft repeated statement was demonstrably false. And people in the system were coming to understand that. Partly because of their own experience and partly because it just so happened that in the previous five years there had been a number of international studies that people in the field had had access to reading. So it wasn't just their anecdotal experience, it was actually being backed up by international evidence. And secondly, the book uh, came about after a decade of massive infusions of new money into the system. That money was supposed to have brought what former Prime Minister Martin called transformative change. So it seemed like a timely moment to study what all of that money had bought. And the answer was, not much. Among the lessons learned from that decade-long infusion of 6 to 7% increases yearly in the healthcare budgets across Canada was one that I think ought to have been foreseen. It's not one of those, I'm wise after the fact. This ought to have been perceived. Namely that whenever large sums of additional money are injected into any public system, whether it's K-12 education, dare I say it, whether it's universities, policing, judicial affairs, or health care, unless the money is tied down, and affixed to performance outcomes, then the providers 
who are always the best organized and the most motivated will scoop up a disproportionate amount of the money. All of these systems, all of them, not just healthcare, are organized more around the prerogatives and the ambitions and the structural power of the providers, the doctors, the nurses, the administrators, the teachers, the professors, the judges, the lawyers, than they are as citizens, citizens as patients, students, and those who seek justice. And predictably, therefore, the largest amount of the $40 billion was injected into the healthcare system by well-intentioned but poorly informed politicians, and it went into the pockets of the healthcare administrators and the doctors and the unionized employees. So the system didn't fundamentally change, but the people who were working in the system, they did better, which is the opposite of a productivity gain, let alone transformative change. Now, healthcare, however organized and financed, is so massive and so complex and so structured around the interests of different groups that it defies sweeping reform. The best that can be hoped for, I've come to the conclusion, are modest improvements that cumulatively over time might make things better, especially for patients. And modest improvements are indeed occurring. The system is not completely static because there are a lot of dedicated, trained, and intelligent individuals who are working in the system or in government ministries. And medical discoveries, too, are helping the patient experience. Some improvements are structural, policy-driven driven structural improvements, especially in the priority now being given to mental health care and to home care. Alas, there remains the terrible problem of 10 to 15 percent of hospital beds that are still being occupied by patients who can't find beds in other facilities that are less expensive the so-called bed blocker problem, and it's terribly expensive. Since a hospital bed per day is obviously much more costly than a bed in a less intensive care facility. So like accessing family doctors off hours, this bed blocker problem has been around for a very long time. And it seems to be one of Medicare's, to coin a phrase, chronic conditions, something to be complained about but something apparently just to be accepted as one of those inconveniences that comes along with all the virtues of Medicare. Another of these chronic conditions are wait times for non-urgent care, because our system does very well for urgent care. If you have a heart attack, you're going to get real good care fast. If you have chronic cancer problems, you'll get good oncological care. Uh, but every international study, alas, demonstrates that in wait times in too many parts of our system are longer than in other countries with public health care systems. If there's one given, and I can say this after 40 years in the business, if there's one given in political election campaigns at the provincial level in Canada, is that it is that the opposition party, whatever party it is, will promise if elected to reduce wait times. The promise is all partisan. <laughs> the NDP made it in British Columbia before they got elected recently. The Conservatives just did it in New Brunswick in the inconclusive election there. All the parties, I watched the French language debate a few weeks ago, they're yakking on about it. And uh, Premier Ford in Ontario, now Premier, got to get used to saying that, grandiosely promised to do something about hallway medicine in the last Ontario campaign. And once elected, as with the BC NDP, the first thing these parties do is to pour more money into some kind of crash program to reduce wait time for joint replacements, for example, defying overwhelming international evidence that injections bring only temporary relief and they solve nothing in the long term. The evidence is here in Canada. When Mr. Harper was campaigning in his successful election campaign, he promised, you may remember those of you who were around, a patient wait time guarantee, and a billion dollars was going to be put into that 
program. It disappeared without a trace. The Canadian Institute for Health Information reported earlier this year that despite fresh infusions of money, wait times for cataract and hip and knee replacements had lengthened from three years ago. Wait times for radiation and hip fracture repair had remained the same. Kaihai also reported that the time spent by Canadians in emergency rooms waiting had increased by 11% from the year before. A com- according to the Commonwealth Fund's multi country survey of health care for seniors, Canada performs well below the international average for timely access to health care for seniors. And as has been repeatedly noted, seniors have difficulty getting medical care after hours without going to see emergency units in the hospitals. Once seniors do see a doctor, their responses to their experience are positive, which rather reflects the general reactions to the entire system. People are generally satisfied once they get into the system. It's accessing the system on a timely basis that is too often the problem. The Trudeau government, and especially its formidable then health minister, Jane Philpott, negotiated, in my view, with determination and intelligence to get a new federal-provincial financing deal. The Liberals had promised in their election campaign that they would increase health care spending by 2% a year. That was their promise. It was a dash of fiscal prudence for a party that began spraying money hither and yon the day it took office. Of course the provinces screamed. We've seen this ritual before. They demanded a return to the good old decade of 6% increases each year. They demanded a return to that level because after the financial meltdown of 2008, their deficits soared and health care increases had dropped dramatically to about 2% across the country. And in some provinces, like in Brunswick, uh, health care budgets didn't increase at all. So in real terms, they actually went down. But the Liberals had seen where the money went in the fat years, and to their credit, they were determined not to make the same mistake. So they insisted to the provinces, you take 2%, and if you agree to spend more on health care, in health care money, on... Uh, mental health and home care, you can get more. Those are our priorities. Those we think are the country's priorities. But we're tying the additional money, as was not the case before, to it being spent in those areas. Through months of high-octane rhetoric and special pleading and political assaults on Ottawa and other predictable theatrics, the province has got nowhere against the formidable Miss Philpott. She cut a deal with one province, and then another, and then another, and they could see the lady wasn't returning, to quote a phrase, until they all fell into line. I don't know Jane Philpott. I've never met her, but I thought that was a virtuoso performance of the first order. We shall see whether the additional money, of which I just spoke, actually goes into mental health and home care. But at least the federal government, having learned a lesson before, tried to nudge the provinces in the right directions. So what are now a few, and there's so many I can only mention a few, of health care challenges ahead? Well, the obvious one, I'm sorry it's a perpetual, uh, are cost pressures. Without pay or fee increases, which is hard to imagine, or building new facilities, or investing in new technologies, Keeping the system running is going to be 4 to 5% more money a year. And that's because population growth is about 1%. And it would appear that inflation is 2%, according to what I just read in the newspapers the other day. But healthcare inflation always is higher than the CPI. But let's assume it's 2%. And aging is going to produce, so it said, another 1%. So that's 4 And as I'm about to explain, I think the aging 1% is a slight underestimation. So that's 4 to 5%, as I say, without all these other things that I just mentioned. So governments are going to be under the gun. And, of course, it's going to be more acute in some provinces than others because their population is going to be aging faster. And aging is, of course, challenging now how we deliver health care, especially to those with a sordid 
and combined chronic conditions and morbidities that eat up the lion's share of the health care budget for seniors. So the average health care cost for those age 15 to 64 is 2800 a year. For those over 80, the average cost is 17000 a year. And for those 85 to 90, it's a share under 25000 In 2016, for the first time ever, there were more Canadians over 64 than there were under 14 years of age. Between 2011 and 2016, the number of Canadians over 85 years of age increased by 19%, four times the rate, growth rate of the overall population. By the mid-2030s, in less than two decades, we're going to have about 10 million seniors. In 2050, Statistics Canada suggests 2.7 million Canadians will be over 85 years of age. Now, the good news here is that more people who are older are going to live longer and be quite healthy. There's a specimen right there. This is an amazing societal accomplishment. That was an accident. (laughs) This is an amazing societal accomplishment. And on many levels, we can take great comfort from this. But we are sliding into the unknown because no society in history, any society in history, has ever experienced that kind of demographic profile with so many elderly people. The healthcare system will be challenged necessarily to respond. So will public budgets because the elderly will push up healthcare budgets, as I said, by 1% at least. Now, the flip side of this coin, which is not often mentioned by healthcare economists who tend to say, look, there's not going to be a tsunami of costs because as the aging population is going to be 1%, maybe 1.2 or 3%. Let's assume that's correct. But at the same time as more and more people retire, their incomes are going to decline. And so will government tax revenues because they will be unable to tax the same base of people in the workforce as outside. So governments of all stripes are going to face the dilemma of higher costs for the elderly, and I might ask pensions for the federal government, with less revenue at current levels of taxation. So that's the double bind. It's not just the elderly spending more money on health care. It's that as they've retired, their incomes will be less, and be able to get as much revenue from them will be harder. And then there are new challenges that include expensive biologic drugs, personalized medicine, and have an enormous consequence and potential for healthcare as for so many other fields will be artificial intelligence. AI has already entered medicine in imaging, diagnostics, robotic surgery. Its influence will undoubtedly spread. But I think, on balance, AI is going to assist <coughs> medical performance and practitioners to do their work better rather than threaten them with beneficial results for patients. Surgeons, in particular, can breathe easily. A recent paper listed 700 occupations that might be replaced by AI. Surgery ranked 685th, so they can calm down. Now, the issue in front of Medicare, at least in the public domain at the moment, facing Canadians, is none of those, but rather universal public coverage for all pharmaceuticals. Proposals now abound for the extension of Medicare to cover all pharmaceuticals. National Pharmacare, as it's called, seems to have the political wind in its sails. The Federal Liberal Party Convention uh, some months ago adopted a resolution calling for National Pharmacare. The federal liberal government appointed Eric Hoskins, who was a former health minister in Ontario, who had often declared himself in favor of National Pharmacare, to lead an, quote, advisory council on the implementation of National Pharmacare. Note, the mandate is not to consider whether National Pharmacare is a sensible idea, but how to implement it. Dr. Hoskins is now canvassing opinion across the country. The liberal-dominated House of Commons Standing Committee on Health supported, and I quote, the inclusion of prescription drugs dispensed outside of hospitals as an insured service under the Canada Health Act. The think tank closest to the Liberal Party, Canada 2020, has endorsed National Pharmacare. And these indications strongly suggest that the Liberals would very much like 
to make some form of national pharmacare a centerpiece of their re-election campaign in October 2019. Politically speaking, uh, the federal liberals, like the Ontario liberals on whom so much of what they do is modeled, believe their political success depends upon squeezing the NDP over on their left. And that means adopting policies like National Pharmacare because that uh, would be consistent with this strategy. The New Democratic Party has always favored National Pharmacare, as do uh, health care unions, uh, Medicare enthusiasts such as Doctors for Medicare, <coughs> some but not all provincial governments, and the bevy of uh, health care analysts in universities who are full-throated defenders of the health care status quo, except for demanding that more money be spent on health care. Two of these academics, whose work some of you may be familiar with, Stephen Morgan of the University of British Columbia and uh, Marc-André Gagnon from Carleton, have been enormously influential, and I give them great credit for this, in pressing the case for national pharmacare. Seldom in recent debates, in my experience, have two academics been more ubiquitously cited and relied upon um, for shaping a public debate around a given issue. Their research underpinned the House of Commons report that I just mentioned. They were approvingly and repeatedly referred to in the Parliamentary Budget Officer's compendious examination of the cost of national pharmacare. A University of Ottawa Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy followed their assumptions. And if Canada ever does adopt a full-blown national pharmacare plan, they might call it the Morgan Gagné plan because um, they have uh, done, they're the intellectual academic fathers uh, of national pharmacare. Full public funding for all pharmaceuticals was an early dream of those in Saskatchewan and later across Canada who espoused publicly financed health care. Emmett Hall, whose Royal Commission led to the creation of National Medicare, stopped short of endorsing a form of full public drug coverage because he worried about the cost, but he did call for programs to, quote-unquote, face the burden of drug costs. Those who argue for National Pharmacare correctly note that in other democratic countries, the United States accepted, of course, all pharmaceuticals on national formularies are covered by public funding. And this is one important reason why in Canada, health care spending is 70% public and 30% private, whereas in many other publicly financed systems, the public share presses more up towards 80%. 64% of drug costs in Canada are spent privately compared to only 10% of health hospital costs and 1.5% of physician costs. So it's this gap, 64% versus 10 and 1.5%, that advocates of National Pharmacare wish to eliminate by making all formulary drugs free for all people all the time, or more precisely, to be free to the user, but obviously not to the taxpayers, who by one means or another have to supply the money to make the drugs free to the users. If all of this evidence is as it is, why has National Pharmacare never taken hold in Canada? After all, it fits within what I would call the ideology of Medicare, ideology being defined as a framework of ideas and ideals within which all policies must fit, whereby only the state can be positioned to guarantee that no one should be denied essential health care. And this ideology is immensely strong in Canada, propounded by politicians of all stripes, believed by Canadians who believe Medicare to be a foundation stone of national identity, as you just mentioned, and supported within universities where the vast majority of those who teach and write about health policy are among the most impassioned guardians of this ideology of Medicare. If doctors, although most of them are independent entrepreneurs, are paid by the state for their services and as hospitals are state financed, and if drugs for hospitals, for patients in those hospitals are paid for publicly, why doesn't the state not cover from general revenues the cost of all medically necessary drugs for everyone all the time? And to ask those questions is to suggest that national pharmacare is shamelessly overdue. 
So since there seems to be so little debate about these issues, except for discussion of modalities, I think at least some fundamental questions should be debated about the desirability and utility of national pharmacare. And I will raise them at the risk of personal injury to myself. A first question might be, is it axiomatic that the extension of the ideology of Medicare, all medically necessary services in hospitals and by hospitals delivered and paid for only by the state, and without competition, social insurance would be a good thing. After all, by international standards, our model, our Medicare model as it stands, is an average performer or worse in the world. It's not a model any other country would adopt. Nobody is clamoring to adopt the Canadian system, notwithstanding the fact that we think that the world needs more Canada. Our system ranks ninth in the Commonwealth Fund's assessment of 11 healthcare systems, up from 10th, I have to say, from the previous Commonwealth study. The OECD places the Canadian system ahead of average in some areas, behind in others, sort of in the middle of the pack, but nowhere near the top. So one might therefore ask a rude question. Why the extension of a very average existing system that ranks rather weakly in international surveys is going to produce anything more if it's extended than middling results. Now, there are facile and accurate answers to the legitimate question as to why no universal drug coverage has happened in Canada. Brand name pharmaceutical companies are an easy target. The assertion being that they have the physicians and politicians in their thrall, which in the era of no corporate contributions to political parties is factually risible but can be politically quite potent. And then there is the argument that the politicians, this is a very favored one, have simply lacked the necessary will, which is true. It's true, of course. But it begs the question, why in the political marketplace has this not been deemed, except for the never-elected NDP, to be a potent, I'm speaking nationally, to be a potent national election promise? It could just be although proponents of national pharmacare wouldn't accept this idea, that most Canadians are actually more or less content with the drug coverage that they have, or at least they're not sufficiently dissatisfied to get terribly upset about it and to be galvanized into a national movement, since 70% of them have some form of pub private coverage, and others are covered by existing public plans for older folks and for poor folks. And therefore, no grounds of support has ever materialized, despite the best efforts of the advocates. Certainly no poll has ever shown if a question about pharmacare is not prompted by the pollster that the issue ranks at or near the top of public priorities, unless, of course, you lump it in with the general category of health care, which is a stretch beyond uh, uh, what's reasonable. So except for those in the NDP, politicians have always blanched at the cost to the Treasury of such a program. If, as some proponents suggest today, National Pharmacare would save the Treasury, save the Treasury billions of dollars, only the most obtuse politicians would turn down a deal whereby a much used and needed product could be universally distributed and save money. I know of no politician who wouldn't be clamoring to suggest that for the population. A surefire vote winner if I ever saw one. Be irresistible. Now, we all know that politicians depressingly often make elaborate promises make, based on implausible assertions and bad arithmetic. In the case of national pharmacare ideas, governments have always hesitated, and their civil servants have provided them with the data because there is no free lunch. <coughs> Such a plan, however devised, will cost plenty of money, and that money can only come from one place, and that place is the taxpayers. The only question being which ones, how much, and when. Now, when Medicare was first introduced nationally in the late 1960s, the government of the day was honest with the people and said, in exchange for this program, you will pay higher taxes, up or down. And the Canadian public said, we're for it. We shall see if in today's climate 
people are willing to pay more tax for a national drug plan. Unless, of course, they believe that they don't have to pay higher taxes, in which case, of course, they'll endorse it. So apart from calculations of political gain, two questions should underline public policy. And we are at a public policy institute, after all. First of all, what problem are we trying to address? And secondly, what's the most effective way of addressing it? Now, National Pharmacare is intended to solve fundamentally two questions. So what problem are we trying to solve? Well, there's two. One, the lack of drug coverage for some Canadians, and two, the high cost in Canada of drugs. As I understand it, those are the two principal problems that are to be addressed. So who is without drug coverage? There seems to be a consensus, as the Parliamentary Budget Office stated, that, quote, an estimated 2% of Canadians lack drug coverage. So if so, in what other area of Canadian life would any government consider a multi-billion dollar investment in a sweeping national plan to solve a problem afflicting 2% of the population? None. To this 2%, however, could be added, should be added, according to various reports, an estimated 10%, some say 13%, of Canadians who, again, in the words of the PBO report, quote, lack the financial means to pay for their prescriptions. In other words, we've got 2% of people who have no coverage, and we've got 10 to 13% of people who have coverage but can't afford to pay the premiums in whole or in part. In other words, they have some kind of coverage, but the premiums and deductibles are beyond their capacity to fully pay or pay at all. It could be, by the way, and this is speculation, that there are just some people who gamble that they can just pay a limited amount for prescription drugs and they won't get clobbered by huge costs uh, when they need very expensive ones. Just who are these 10% is a little bit unclear. They would seem, according to a report from the federal and provincial ministers of health, to be mostly part-time workers and self-employed individuals. Not the very poor, there are plans for them, not seniors, plans for them. Whether they can afford in this group to pay some or off uh, of the costs would presumably depend upon their needs and their ability to pay, and that might vary quite considerably. I just want to add a personal note here. This was drilled home to me. My stepbrother is in Kelowna and was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease a few weeks ago, and I flew out to Kelowna to be with him. He's 74. And, of course, all of his chemotherapy drugs will be covered by the state. But there could be anti-nausea drugs and others, which will have to come out of his pocket. So I phoned his pharmacist, and I said, look, what is the premium that he will have to pay? He's very low income. And she looked it up. She said, about $1,000. Well, my stepbrother doesn't have $1,000 easily to pay for this. That, that, that's the kind of group that is in trouble. Uh, when we don't have better coverage. So we're left with about 12% of Canadians who are in some form of need. That would be a little over 4 million Canadians, which raises the question in a country where 33 million people are covered by public or private plans whether we need a complete overhaul of drug policy, wiping out or replacing all private coverage with public coverage, some of that private coverage is actually more generous than you'd get under a public plan. Ask anybody who works in the Canadian Auto Workers Union whether they'd be prepared to give up the private plan they had for a public plan at a cost that variously estimated in the billions of dollars and setting off what would be difficult negotiations, but not impossible, between the provinces and Ottawa over which level of government would pay how much. A very Canadian discussion. But assume the answer is yes. Assume that Canada needs a plan to cover those without proper insurance and that only National Pharmacare can do the trick. So what would it cost? Well, the answer depends, of course, upon what drugs would be included in the formula. What reductions could one big government plan reasonably expect to negotiate with the private drug companies? The theory is that one big buyer could negotiate lower, lower prices than many public and private plans and also substitute more generic plug drugs for brand name drugs. And this assertion is likely true. The only question being, and it's an important one, by how much? 
Now, if drug prices were lower, economists suggest that use would rise. Again, by how much? Would taxpayers, as in Europe, where there are these plans, be charged a deductible for every drug? Or would there be no taxpayer contribution, as suggested by the Commons Committee, in keeping with the ideology of Canadian Medicare? So there are so many variables at play that it's hard to be precise in terms of the cost. But one attempt was made by Kevin Page, the former parliamentary budget officer, who is now at my university, runs the University of Ottawa Institute mentioned earlier. Now, his report favored national pharmacare. But it took pains to explain that although the national plan would lower the cost of drugs, Ottawa taking over the private sector role, the migration of costs from consumers and employers to governments, would drive up the government's overall costs <clears throat> such, as the, such that the federal, and here I'm quoting him, budget deficit would almost double over the medium term. The debt-to-GDP ratio would rise such that, and I quote, federal finances are likely to be rendered fiscally unsustainable. Mr. Page also noted that, quote, with provinces being broadly in a fiscally unsustainable position currently, cost-sharing of national pharmacare would make them that much worse off. And provinces, as you know, are generally in a weaker fiscal position than Ottawa, so that, quote, expanding pharmacare benefits without increasing revenues or cutting expenditure elsewhere at the sub-national level of government to offset the additional costs of pharmacare would only exacerbate the problem. Mr. Page had a solution. He said, raise the HST by two points. I thought that was a rather blithe answer, frankly, because it didn't take into account of what such a large tax increase might do to the overall economy. Or why such an increase, if we decided to raise the GST by two points, which would get us 12 or 14 billion additional dollars, why would we spend it on this program and not so many others? But at least Mr. Page offered an estimate. Most advocates don't. The Commons Committee, as politicians are wont to do, punted the issue. It said merely that Ottawa should, quote, provide additional funding to provinces and territories without saying how much Ottawa, how Ottawa would get the additional money. It wouldn't fall down from the sky. The, committed, the committee quoted Professor Morgan as testifying that, quote, a new revenue tool would have to be created to raise funds to finance the program. Et alors? Et alors? His fellow advocate, Professor Gagnon, talked about raising corporate taxes or maybe imposing a payroll tax or maybe raising funds through general taxation, something like the HST or personal income taxes. In other words, there is agreement among these advocates that higher taxes will be required, but which ones and by whom and by how much remains unclear and, I would add, editorially, politically, let's say, controversial. What the committee didn't ask, this is the House of Commons Committee, are there other more targeted ways of getting at those without coverage or with too little coverage that would cost much less and hit the right targets instead of blanketing the entire population most of which is already covered by existing private or public plans. Surely, it seems to me, that kind of analysis deserves, that kind of option deserves analysis. And it is brushed aside over and over again in the literature by people who say, well, that would be a patchwork. Well, Medicare is a patchwork. <laughs> I mean, there is an ideology of Medicare, but look at other things within the healthcare system that aren't covered by Medicare in whole or in part. We have a patchwork. What Canadians think about higher taxes for national pharmacare is unknown because the issue has never been squarely presented to them, as was the case in the late 1960s that I mentioned earlier. The Angus Reid Institute polled Canadians in 2015, three years ago, and found that a majority was in favor of a national drug plan, provided that they didn't have to pay for it, with either higher personal income taxes, health care premiums, or increases in the HST. They favored only higher corporate taxes. 
In other words, we're for this plan as long as we don't have to pay. Corporations will pay. Even if it could be argued that taxes should be raised, leaving aside on whom and by much, the issue is why higher taxes for national farming? It is a much observed tendency in the healthcare world, which I spend a lot of time, that doctors and nurses and other and unionized workers, administrators, analysts, university professors, home care and nursing home advocates, they all assert that more money should be spent on health care. That is a universally shared view. That the education system, K-12, might need more. That universities in a province such as Ontario now receive more money from student fees than they do for government, and that maybe government should give the universities a bit more money. Where the cities need more and better transit, or that reducing poverty or helping aboriginals, uh, they might use the extra couple of billion dollars, that that might, no. If you're in the healthcare bubble, it's healthcare uber Alice. They don't look about the other around them. It's health care, health care. And they know that health care is this national icon. And they know that it's already taking more than 40% of the budget. And they know that the public is deeply attached to the system. And so they can come up with any number of explanations as to why additional dollars should be put into health care. And I'm just raising the question, if you had an extra, I don't know, pick a number, billion dollars, is it axiomatically right that it should all go into health care? They all think so because they work in the system. The list is endless. Resources are rather finite, but in the myopic world of health care where demands are relentless and the capacity to finance them is stretched, advocates who live within that health care bubble never cease demanding more spending on Home care, mental health, nursing, long-term institutionalized care, higher fees for physicians, basic research, you name it, and now a national drug plan. Without so much of a thought, as I said, of perhaps some of the money or all of the money might be spent somewhere else. These are among the macro issues. There are numerous micro ones that at least ought to be discussed before we embark on national pharmacare. But for the moment, as far as I observe, nobody is raising them. Certainly not the federal government that seems, as I said, to have made up its mind, in part because of its pro the program's putative political allure, and this isn't a government that places fiscal prudence as a high priority. By the way, my pollster friends say that they're totally in tune with the Canadian public opinion on that at the moment. But there is another argument for national pharmacare that should be considered, its ability to drive down the high cost of drugs. Remember I said there public policy, your objectives, and your modalities? Well, here's the second objective. And Canada's drug bill is high. In 2016, Canada's patented drug prices, patented, were the third highest among 29 countries in the OECD. Some of that gap is explained by higher prices, some of it by more extensive drug use. We're big per capita drug users in Canada. It's a whole other issue. An aging population is likely to inflate drug costs more because obviously older folks use more drugs than younger folks do. And also note, private and public drug plan budgets are inflated more by a few patients than by the mass of the population. For public plans, 2% of beneficiaries account for one-third of spending. And for private plans, 72% of the costs are driven by 14% of the recipients. Spending on biologic and oncology drugs have gone up in recent years. Curative drugs for hepatitis C, developed by brand name companies, have been particularly costly, but also have been effective. Canadian governments have not been unaware of the country's relatively high drug costs, and they have been acting to restrain them. These acts will take some time to work their way through the system. Provinces have, have branded together uh, to negotiate for brand name, new brand name drugs that are coming on the market. The Trudeau government instructed the Patented Medicine Pharmaceutical Review Board, which is charged with keeping the increase of brand name drugs at the rate of national inflation, to change the basket of countries with which we compare our drug prices. They removed the United States and Switzerland, which are two countries whose drug costs are even higher than ours, and they replace them with lower drug cost countries. So now the, now the comparable countries with which this agency has to 
deal will be lower. I think there's another step that Ottawa could and should take, which is to allow Ottawa to negotiate drug purchases on behalf of all the provinces for their various drug plans. In fact, I have always thought there should be one national formulary in Canada. The differences between the formulary in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, I've never looked at it in detail. I can't believe it's very different except at the margin. After all, it's the federal government that determines which drugs are safe for entry into the Canadian market. It would make sense for it to negotiate for those drugs, bringing to bear the purchasing capacity of 37 million Canadians instead of the individual provincial populations. This is what happens in Australia, a federation where the Pharmaceutical Benefits Authority Advisory Committee negotiates in effect for the states who then draw upon the national formulary. If a Canadian province wanted to add to the national formulary and pay for it, it could do, through, do so through negotiations with drug suppliers. If Quebec refused to join a national negotiation, fine. It could negotiate on its own. But what would happen is that Quebec, with its population of about a quarter of Canadian population, would find that its purchasing power would be less than the three quarters greater in the rest of the country, and quietly, quietly, like cat's feet, they would come into the national plan under some negotiated agreement because their citizens would say, écoutez, là, on pay X, and en Ontario, on pay moins, là, c'est pas juste. So this wouldn't be national farm care. This would be just an element of it, a national buying effort for public plans. It would be half a loaf towards one of the objectives now being discussed, lower prices, without embracing the entire apparatus and cost of national Medicare. Would the provinces object? Maybe. But if national buying relieved a little pressure from their public drug budgets, particularly for seniors, that those budgets are going to go up, I think they'd probably come to terms. Would citizens object? Probably not if drug prices fell and they didn't have to pay higher taxes. Its biggest liability? To some extent, it lies outside the ideology of Medicare and therefore might lack the emotional appeal of National Pharmacare. Anyway, those are some thoughts, and I'm happy to take your questions or dodge your brickbats, as the case may be.